of scanning keys, but he he had the development system, and so for him it was the easiest, simplest thing mm -hmm. to do. Anyway, like this, this is one of Wendell's. Okay, Wendell's keyboards. Yeah, Wendell Sanders. Yeah, okay. and the the gate array is underneath is it this. Gate array or an FPGA? I think it's a gate array, but I'm I'm not the one even. I mean, because that know, would be it, it, it was it was a big big ass chip like that. Right, but it, all he did was program it, right? Yes. So it's an FPGA, right? Field program. Field program. Right. Otherwise, it'd be off to a foundry oh, with a hundred thousand dollar type. I see. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah FPGA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a long time. So Daniel Kotke here, booting up the replica Apple One. We hope. Well, why don't I try it with this monitor? First? Try it with the original monitor. That was your monitor, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, but for Apple Twos, not for Apple Twos. Ones. I have no idea whether it'll work for the Apple One. It's, I, I don't. I would say fifty-fifty. <laughs> I'm telling you, I spent, I spent, uh, I think it was 2018. So I started this project in 2016, inspired by a vintage computer festival, and then it took me many months. The first four boards that I built, not one worked. And I couldn't debug them because they didn't have one working board with known good parts. So I'm like swapping, 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 and it was extremely frustrating. And I finally got the fourth board to work. And then I got the other ones to work. But, and, and so that, and then little time went by, and then it's like, okay, well, and then I designed a case, so I have a plastic case. But for a full package for a museum, I said, oh wait, the monitor. Yeah. I've got to source the monitors if I want these people to use this. And you can, so then I started looking into monitors and I, and I had monitors all over my house. So I collected them all, I completely took over the kitchen. And I, testing all the monitors, one after one did not work. And some of them would halfway work and the video would slip. You know, it's just mm. annoying. Oh, I remember that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, this one here in this box here is a Dell. It's a Dell VGA mm -hmm. that was small enough to actually carry, and it was under fifty bucks. But if it was scrolling, it would jitter. It was oh, annoying. Annoying. In yeah. a static display, it didn't look too bad. And this one is probably your original. Original from Apple, right? Because you put your Apple system logo on. Well, I on. put that on there, but I bought this with my own money. I don't remember where, but this was not even Apple. This is me as a hobbyist. And yeah, that's a CCTV monitor. It's a CCTV yeah. monitor. Just like a fan one, but it's not safe. Well, this was the most popular one that we used around Apple in the very early year because it was available and it was maybe 100 bucks. Not so much. All right. Ding, ding, ding. Wait, plug in the power. Little power. Is that the original size of the Apple One board? <laughs> this is an exact replica of the original Apple One board. With all the original parts? No, 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 no original parts. No original parts, even the chips? Hey, it's kind of working. And there's the re reset sequence. Wow. Oh, that's right. fucked up. No. You see a cursor. Yeah, but. There oh, you go. there it is. Computer. Okay. Oh. Dumping a little bit of memory. Yeah. Now, if you, now if you can load basic from a cassette, I'll be. <laughs> oh. First try. Yeah, you're. <laughs> yeah, that's cheap. Yeah, cheap. Vertical cheap. and horizontal would probably need adjustment. So. What is that? There's no, oh, there we go. Horizontal, whoops. There you go. Yeah. Not bad. Probably the last person that put his hands on that knob was you. Uh, <coughs> okay, now watch this. This is the cool demo. So this is the compact flash card for the mm -hmm. Apple II. And the guy, and after he made this, then he went back and changed the bus for he, the Apple he One. as well. Rich Dreyer in um, Minnesota somewhere. Okay. Um, and I, I bought the last few of these cards he had and then they were none. And I was really upset because I wanted to make more of these and I don't want to make any more of these without this because this makes it so much better. Okay, so here's what you're gonna see. When I turn the power on, 
Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. I didn't put this in wrong. Uh oh. Alright, so we didn't break break it. So is it possible it goes like this? I thought it was card face out. Like this. Yeah. I should remember that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, see if the card works now. You know, at least the computer's still okay. It's possible that I broke it. So that's fitting in the cassette interface. I have another one here. Okay, so. So the computer's fine. Now, so here's what we did. This is just a compact flash, allowing you to save using the cassette commands. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I tracked down the guy who wrote the firmware for this car. Hmm. who happens to work at Apple now. He Dave does. Lyons, yeah, which was an amazing coincidence. And he was like, busy, busy, busy guy. And I took him out to lunch, and I pumped him up using my Steve Jobs copied uh, charisma, and uh, <laughs> I got him to modify the firmware to auto-boot, okay? Right. Now, so you still need the keyboard, so all you have to do is type 9000 R, this is the hello program, so hello. And it's, and a, that, it's an integer hello program, it, what it, basic. This is basic, yeah. and so wow. this is the hello program yeah. in basic. So what it did was it loaded basic, launched basic, went back and loaded the hello program, and then launched that, which was a whole bunch of menu choices from the firmware on this card. and. I couldn't believe that it worked the first time because he didn't even have an Apple one to test it on. He just like right. modified the code. He goes, oh, this might work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so now what you can do, so here's the program. There it is. And um, so now the thing is, this is now like you could, like the hello program could be a very complicated demo program. And now all you have to do is type 9000 R. And boom, it goes. Do you have other demo programs on there? There are a bunch of uh, demo programs that come on this. Right. But to get to those, you have to go into back. that menu. It's, and and it's like multi, it's it. like you have to L yeah, for yeah. load. I mean, you got to do it like you normally have to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to really do it. It's E1000R. Right. Well, E1000R is where basic starts. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, and now from the last Vintage Computer Festival. This is the demo that I had, which won't run now. But, so here's what I did. This was in 2019. I had this all working. And I thought, well, I never, I never actually designed anything that would connect to the Apple One bus. So I just put some gates together, and lo and behold, it worked. It surprised the heck out of so me. So you have an ESP32 or something? I put an ESP32. This is a Node MCU, yeah. okay, on a module. And the way this works is um, it was a massive head. Actually, the, the ESP32 now has its development environment in the Arduino oh. IDE. And I was waiting for that to happen. That only happened three years ago. And so I was willing to learn that. And that wasn't so bad. It only took a few days to kind of get up and running. What was really bad is that the uh, USB interface on this thing is not the standard Arduino one, and it's not even in the library. So you have to go to a Chinese website that's not in English and mm. click download on something where you can't even read. And I thought, well, school kids are never going to do this. But anyway, I did get it working. And so the way this works is... I don't remember it now, but um, so I had a basic program where you could hit the space bar and it would um, toggle a line on the bus and wake this thing up. And this thing would wake up and if you had pre-programmed it correctly with the SSID mm -hmm. password, it would go to oh, if this, network? then that, yeah. and it would look up the program I had saved yeah. on if this, then that, and, send an email. and then it would send an email to my phone. 
Okay, so I was demoing the Apple One sending an email to my man. I'd be holding the phone, <laughs> ding, and you know, a few seconds would go by, ding, <laughs> which was so cool. <laughs> and unfortunately, the, um, at the last minute, they changed the SSID and password at the Computer History Museum, yeah. so then mm -hmm. it didn't uh, work on the day of the show. Uh, I thought you had it work for me. Well, I had, I definitely had it you, working. You failed to make the proper sacrifices. Well, they gave, me, they, gave me, they gave me the wrong password for the Wi-Fi, and I couldn't go back. I didn't have my Arduino recompile. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You just hard-coded it and didn't have any way anyway, to change it. So. Yeah. So, so, Daniel, what other things are running on the, on the simulated cassette interface? Well, I could, I, you know, there's, there's demos. There's demos that came with the early... Apple One, mm -hmm. of which I never really spent time looking at them. What I always liked is at this point, you can write your own basic program. You can save it, turn the machine off, turn it on again and right. run your own program. And that's the, that is the experience. That is the experience that motivated me to make these. Right. Because this was the very first one where you could do that. Yeah, yeah. Or you could just print like, uh, say, print three plus five right now and it would, yeah. right? I think you probably can. I. Uh, but you can't print. say print 3.5. No. Uh, <laughs> 2 plus 8. 2 plus 5. Yeah. 7. Wow, it did work. So, somebody else, there's a project out on the internet. I know one of the guys who took the ESP32 and then made a television interface. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So, it actually, it, you just attach a wire to one of the pins and it displays text on the screen. Wow. Then somebody else wrote a 6502 emulator, and then somebody else wrote an Apple One emulator. Wow. So for three bucks, you can emulate the, the, Apple, board. the yeah. Apple One. You can tell Matt wow. into it to get to it. Wow. Where did you hear about this? Somewhere. I, I don't know. I have People do that all the time. With so so, so in, our, in our museum, I've got the 32 chip. Yeah. I've got the Mimeo. Right. Yeah, there's a PDP-8 running on it, too. So, and yeah. somebody else just got the IBM PC running. Yeah, on it. so I mean, it's it's... Powerful Crazy. compared to any old, you know, system. Uh, how much of the TV typewriter influenced the Apple One, do you think? That's a really good question. Uh, Waz insists that he did not build the Don Lancaster TV typewriter, but he had a very similar thing. Mm. And, uh, you know, to talk about the Apple One schematic, I could never make sense of it mm. at all. It's a very complicated thing. To a mad, and it had speed. The video is cycling continually in a feedback loop. Right. It's it's the the cursor position is a moment in time during scrolling through the thousand characters. Wow. Right. So wow. the the cursor position is stored in this thousand bit shift register right there. Right there. Um, and um, uh, I never understood the Apple. Even you know, I went. I was only a technician at the time. I couldn't read any schematics. Yeah, but yeah. years later, I went back to the Apple One schematic. I was like, "What the hell is this?" And then, and I never understood it. And then I was at the Computer History Museum one day, standing next to Steve Innes. Mm, mm -hmm. Rest in peace. Yes, yes. And Steve was an early homebrew computer guy, and he said, "And we're sitting there looking at the TV typewriter." And and Steve goes. Yeah, Steve Wozniak built one of those. He brought it to homebrew. And I'm going, ding, 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 ding. ding, ding. ding. <laughs> Which explained the weird schematic. You're he right. started with the TV typewriter, which had, which had a byte-wide interface. And he added this PIA, right. par parallel right. port, dual parallel port. Right. And so the processor is, the processor in the dynamic RAM is like one separate module that's muxed onto the bus. And the rest is all this stuff. This is all the TV typewriter. Right. Right. And he did the very clever thing of taking the um, the count chain for the timing signals for the video and using those timing signals to refresh the RAM, which was a smart thing to do. Right. And nobody had really he got a patent. Typical Waz on move, that. right? He got a patent on that for the Apple II. So you were the only person actually working in the garage assembling these for the bite shop order? Well, most of the bite shop order was done before I arrived, mm. and I don't know how much. And I'm kind of amazed 
that I don't remember ever serializing boards. Hmm. Maybe the boxes were serialized, but I don't think I did it. Hmm. But I wasn't really keeping a notebook, so I don't remember. So you were literally sitting there lining up the chips and putting them in the sockets and then testing testing. Yeah, the actually, I would build a few boards at a time. I would like meet meet because the tubes were on the chips were in rails, and I'd meter out the chips for like three boards at a time, yeah. and then you could go faster. You and could do three in an hour instead of one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, and then I had to test them all, and um, we didn't even do memory testing. Hmm. Uh, I was mostly testing all the characters, which you know didn't need to be done because the characters came out of a character generator right. ROM, so right. that wasn't going right. to fail. That wasn't going to fail, yeah. Uh, um, but then I had to load basic from tape, and I just that was always so annoying. Because right. the, from one tape to once you had the level set on a particular tape recorder and a particular tape, it would be consistent. Yeah. But anytime you swapped a tape or swapped the recorder, you had to fiddle with it to get it to work. Mm. And it was just so annoying. So I, I never wanted to do that again. That's why. Was should have added level a level LED on the cassette board. Right. Because right. So. I'd love to hear your take on why this worked. And RCA, huge company, has a Cosmac single board computer, went nowhere. Right. You have Rockwell with the AIM, which is not right. that different. Why well, I, I would say the fact that, that this was running basic had everything to do with it. Yeah, but so did the AIM. Rockwell AIM ran basic. Yeah, I don't it just had a crappy display. It just I didn't even know anything about that. It just had a single, line, a single line display. So this, this uh, would mm, work useless. with a television yeah. right. through an RF modulator, right. which was huge. illegal. Yeah. But was it illegal? It was illegal. And Rod Holt at Apple knew Marty. And Marty was the junk guy who would come with his truck loaded of m and modulators and Apple would just buy them for cash and sell them under the table, <laughs> right? But that was the part that was illegal, which wasn't an It was illegal because it, it, it radiated. Was they, weren't, they were uncertified, yeah. Right, <laughs> and they could never could be certified. Right, too yeah, leaky. Yeah, yeah. And uh, which is why uh, uh, it wasn't too long before the Apple II came spray painted with graphite right. paint. Mm -hmm. on that was all when FCC was just starting the right. whole, you know. Mm -hmm. Which is why the Apple III yeah. is a damn boat anchor yeah. case of solid aluminum because yeah. they yeah. were paranoid about not passing it. All the companies at that time were going through that and yeah. changing oh, things. Okay. In there. Right, right. It was a, it was, no one knew how to do it. And, you right. Know, no FCC right. test sites would pop up and charge a fortune for you to go test your stuff there. And anyway, so uh, the first Al Alcorn mentioned to me just this year in an email that the Apple One video didn't work. And he and Waz, so um, Waz only knew Al through Steve Jobs, who worked at Atari. And Al was the grandfatherly type guy who would help anyone with anything. So it was Al Alcorn who tweaked the video output. Yeah. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. And as to the timing, well, timing is very complicated. But Waz got that from some. Yeah, it's. It's, it's, I mean, CC, CCTV timing is different from standard NTSC timing on its own. Oh. It was simplified to begin with. Right. It's monochrome only. It doesn't have the color subcarrier and all that right. kind of stuff. The Apple II had to deal with all that, had to deal with the, the colors and everything. But, uh, you know, the first thing didn't have colors and didn't, you know, so the timing was simplified. And that, people built colored ones with the wrong timing with the wrong all timing. the time. Right, you know? yeah. So right. then they got you know, rainbow effects and horizontal one. Yeah, it was a learning experience and of for course, everybody. Of course, Waz was designing the Apple II in parallel. At the same time. So that he have a color machine, right? Yes, yeah. that's right. And the, the anecdote that I really love is Waz tells the story about going to a computer show in Las Vegas. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly when, but it was, this was before the Apple II. Right. And, well, actually, so Al Alcorn explained to Waz how color works oh, on, okay. in the NTSC standard. Right, okay? right, right. And um, so that he had a basic framework, and he said he was at this, he'd been up all night working, 
He was at this trade show and he's in Las Vegas and there's lights everywhere. And he said, my vision was blurry and I was getting color fringing. <laughs> and, and then, so he has this idea, wait a minute. If I take a, a you know, a four bit value with a one yeah. and shift the one, and let's see, does the timing work out right? It's the color burst carrier is four megahertz, right? And, and so that's where he had the idea that he could just take a one bit value and shift it and phase shift it and get different colors. Mm. And lo and behold, it did work. In the same looping fashion. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at the time, I didn't know any of this stuff. Yeah. It took decades to learn these stories. Yeah, and, and somewhere in there is the story of how it turns out that your odd and even bits change color. You know, if you have two adjacent ones on, the color, the net color is different. I don't even Oh, yeah, well. yeah, amplitude color. Was like you know, like if you wanted something all blue, you had to skip every other hmm. bit. In your, the, I think the memory. basic idea is well, that between sorry. red, green, and blue—that's the three primaries. If you take a analog pulse and just shift it, you'll go through the colors. Well, that's how NTSC works. It's right, a right, it's right, a phase right. difference right. between the you know. Hmm. Anyway, why is that on the subcarrier? Well, I just hadn't known that. Who's, this is Corey's. <laughs> Corey, but we're giving chip, one to the cat. Your chips. Are, <laughs> this is the cat before the mouse. So, so, so here, here's the retail end of this story. A former employee who had been a sales rep for Commodore, and Baltimore schools were looking whether they're going to buy Commodore pets or Apple IIs. Mm. And they decided to go with the Apple IIs because they had color, mm -hmm. and the Commodore didn't. But they didn't have any budget to buy color monitors. Right. So mm -hmm. <laughs> he was pretty annoyed because they bought the Apple II for color. It's always next year, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. What are you reloading now, Dan? Oh, no, I'm just going to type a demo. Whoops. Well, let's say. And yours are. The same. Yeah. So these are variable boards that you populated? Yep. Then the this is going to 16 the keyboards. Yeah, it is. These keyboards are the ones that Next. you mentioned. Yeah. Well, there we go. Oh, it didn't work right. Hello, hello, hello. Ah, it's working very This is the well. hello programming. Yeah. I didn't do H tab right. I think H tab. Oh, yeah, it didn't come out. Oh, where's 12? 12. 12. Oh. H tab. Oh, I, I, I was going to scroll it over. Yeah. Maybe I need a parentheses. Yeah. Oh, that's a syntax error. And how long is it? 50 years ago almost? Uh, not quite. Tell you why she's it's it's right. Okay. 45 years. Uh, yeah, one more try. Yeah. It's not, oh, there's no brackets on this keyboard. It has to be parentheses. It has to be parentheses. Uh, but it's not. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I know what it is. Oh, it's just tab. It's just tab, yeah. Tab one. Tab I. Tab there I. we go. Run. There. Yeah. That's what computers do. <laughs> now it's slowing down. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, for this magnificent demo of the Apple One. Uh, and, and that's the difference between this and submitting your cards overnight yes and finding out you've got a syntax error in the first line right <laughs> in your jcl which made yeah. no sense well, yeah. yeah there we go there we go yes. that's wrapping so uh and then so then at, when i was doing all the monitor experiments um just for compare so i had the apple II on the kitchen table because you know i'm thinking okay they made seven million Apple IIs, you'd think all these video adapters would work with the Apple II, but they didn't. Hmm. So I would test it on the Apple II first. If it worked on the Apple II, then I would test it on the Apple I, and it wouldn't work. <laughs> and then at some point, I, I, I wanted to have similar 
like take, take, take this program, I wanted to run it on the Apple II and the Apple I side by side. Well, you can imagine what what I found. The Apple II okay. ran faster. The app on the if you take exactly this program yeah. on the Apple II, it's a blur. You won't see anything, right? Is it so fast, you mean? Because it's so fast. Yeah. And on you'd have to put a, a half a second, yeah, wait, 100 yeah. millisecond loop between characters. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is a TV typewriter, you get one character per frame. Mm -hmm. No matter per what. Per video frame. So you yeah. only ever get 30 characters a second, like a oh. teletypewriter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is 30 characters a second. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the Apple II is just running full speed. So that's then I that's an interesting demo. I'm try. Yeah, and so then <laughs> I uh, then I uh, wrote a delay loop for the Apple II to tweak it to slow it down, so it would kind of be you could kind of look at them side by side. That's wonderful. And then um, and then at some point, I wanted to write a delay loop for the Apple One, and I'm screwing around with my machine code. And then, and I got it to work, and then I went and the, Waz wrote a basic manual for the Apple One. It's very short. Yes. But guess what? He wrote a random function. I didn't remember that at all. And I'm thinking, this is so primitive. What the hell did he do to create the random, random function? Yeah. I know. And then yeah. in the Apple Two, the way we did it is we had, um, you know, 8K of ROM. And you would pick a number and step through the ROM and then step it, you know, you'd like be stepping through the ROM. But the ROM's not random in any sense. I don't know what he did on the Apple One. That's a, and I, I think I wrote to him and I said, how did you do that? We could, I, I would look in the source code to see how he did that. Yeah, it's in, it's in the source, yeah. I, so you can do a RAND function on this and it's actually pretty good. Don't paste any cryptography behind that. <laughs> anyway, so here's the Apple One. Full speed. <laughs> well, 